I have a quote. If I try to find a handy formula for the time before 1914, in which I was raised up, I hope to be most precise if I say it was the golden age of security. Nobody believed in wars, in revolution, or overthrows. Everything radical, everything violent seemed impossible in the age of reason. Insensibly, there was built up in the German mind a conception of Germany and its emperor as of something splendid and predominant as nothing else had ever been before. A godlike nation in shining armor, brandishing the good German sword in a world of inferior and very badly deposed peoples. That was Herbert George Wells, British, which exemplifies pretty much the attitude that the British had to the... Um, World War One. So today we're going to talk about World War One, and this is, comes from a personal point of view. After we talk about an overview, sadly enough, people have forgotten totally about World War One, the veterans and the many that were killed on both sides of the water. The memorial statue in the left hand, upper left hand of the picture, is from Dover, New Jersey. Uh, in Heard Park, and each rock that you see him standing on has the name of a veteran. Some made it, some did not. And uh, you can drive by it. The poppy is a symbol which I no longer can find the paper version. Uh, it grows in shell craters and also is in the shape of a cross, so it became a symbol. Well, let's start with the image that we all have, this is a British soldier, the American doughboy over there. Well, we've heard some of that, but again, a lot of it has been lost in our history. My World War I ancestors are on both sides of the water, and part of it is their story, one very personal. My grandfather, in German, Vietze Feldwebel Alwin Ficke, was killed in action and is buried in Suain, Persley, Erlu in France. His brother, Unter Offizier Wilhelm Ficke was killed in action, buried in Langemark, Belgium, three months after his brother was killed. Gefreiter Julius Lubrecht was also killed in action and is buried in Langemark, Belgium. Uh, Unter Offizier Heimeyerhoff, my grandmother's brother, took his own life in 1930 with post trauma stress. And Leutnant, as they say in German, Rudolf Meyerhoff survived only because he was older. Meanwhile, my other grandfather, Adolf Lubrecht, survived. He designed bunkers. Went to Officer Karl Lubrecht survived, and Feldwebel Wilhelm Lubrecht, an engineer, survived. Uh, Captain Charles A. Lubrecht is a wonderful story for another time. U.S. Army. He also obviously survived and became a very successful surgeon. Let's take a look at what caused World War I, give you a little bit of an overview. Because many times I'll ask or have asked people, well, what's World War I? And they say Pearl Harbor. Uh, it's for next time. But seriously, um, this is the assassination of the Archduke Ferdinand by a Serbian rebel. And the Serbian were uprising against the Austria-Hungary government. By the way, this comes off the last 10 years of the 19th century when anarchy was rife, McKinley was assassinated, mm -hmm. King of Spain was assassinated, and the Duchess, this young, this man's mother was stabbed to death, the Empress. So here's the headline from the Times, heir to Austrian throne, assassinated, wife by his side, also shot to death, earlier attempt to their lives failed. Well, the way that happened, by the way, is the rebel tried to shoot him, and the gun didn't go off, so the carriage took off, went around the corner, right into the same guy with a bomb that he threw into there. So that's the overview. This starts the world at war. Why? Some say because the Kaiser would planned it. Others say it was alliances and so forth. However, needless to say, it became this kind of thing. Kaiser Wilhelm, you'll see in the lower left-hand picture, and you'll see him seated on his horse being greeted by all the troops, Kaiser Wilhelm II, by the Truppen im Felde. Well, yeah, really? You'll notice him holding his reins with his left hand. That is impossible. His left hand hung by his side for his whole life, and he could not use it. Uh, he was It was his birth. His grandmother, Queen Victoria, had sent English doctors there. And 
Victoria's daughter wanted the English doctors, the German doctors took over. It was a mess. And whichever doctors, I think it was the German delivered him, he was delivered with an umbilical cord around his shoulder, which paralyzed his arm pretty much for life. And he was punished for it and so forth. But the most notable feature is his mustache. And in German, we call that a schnurrbog. And every man in Germany copied that schnurrbog. So anyway, August of 1914, the Germans were called up. Now in Germany, thanks to Bismarck, you, Bismarck, you did 25 years in the reserves. So all the reserves were called up, and they thought it was a great adventure. This is a picture of them going off to war, the ladies cheering, and all that wonderful stuff. The posters, which were very big at that time, uh, help us beat them is what this says. Um, they want you to join up. The other one, Kitchener, now he's the one who really spun the, um, the media to a degree that caused a lot of animosity. Anyway, the books that came out of it, we all know All Quiet on the Western Front, now in its third version of a movie. And in German, it's Im Westen nichts Neues. And the name of that title in German, you know, in the West, nothing's new. Mm -hmm. And so this, um, he wrote the book. They're not too sure where he served. They think in Belgium. He married the American actress Paulette Goddard, moved to this country, and we'll never know. Wake up, America. Civilization. Well, this is 1916. We don't go into the war for America until 1916. It's over in 1918. You can see Columbia calls and the patriotism was rife. There was music, which I can't really reproduce when Tony goes over the top. All this wonderful patriotic music. I'm a Yankee doodle dandy, all of that. Now, America, the hope of all who suffer, the dread of all who wrong save food. The idea was America would go to war to save humanity from the nasty Hun. This monument stands right near my grandfather's grave in Suain, uh, France, more on him later, and that monument is for the French, German, and British soldiers who died there. This is the book I wrote based on my grandfather's story, and more on that later, but he's the man in the middle. And he was, uh, he wrote letters home, which for a lot of reasons, my grandmother saved for me, which were given to me after her death. And she remarried. That's probably why, but more again on that. This is the trail of the letters. If you can see it from, from the, Ar it starts, he wrote them in the Argonne Forest in Germany. They went back home to my grandmother's in Oldenburg. Then they went across the water on the SS George Washington to Ellis Island, where my grandmother was scheduled to marry a an American citizen, which would make her an instant citizen. They lived there on West 11th Street, Lower Manhattan, which still looks the same. It's a historic district. They moved to West 57th Street, a German neighborhood. And then she moved to the Bronx, ended her life in River Edge, New Jersey, where the letters ended up. But there is more to the story. This is the miraculous tale of the letters. This is my house, was my house. You see the arrow? That was my office. House caught fire. We lost everything. Everything in the house was destroyed, except for jewelry and the letters. Wow. Letters? Now, why the letters survived, they were on a shelf behind my desk, and a loose leaf slipped over them, so when the fireman put water in, and it burned for three days, this house was built in 1799. Uh, the letter survived. So I figured there was a message here of some sort that I'm not missing. Meanwhile, in the front page of the Frankfurt Press in 2014, this picture appeared. My grandfather's the guy in the middle. He was a poster boy for, um, for the German army because he lived next door to a painter. And he's carrying a sword, you'll notice, which means he was an acting lieutenant, which cost him his life. These are the letters that they sent. The Kaiser gave you stationery. And my problem was, it's an old German script in Grandpa's Scribble. Mm -hmm. I just found out lately that in 1906, he'd been in Africa, in the Africa Corps, because mm -hmm. they could call you up anytime they wanted. And up at the top, you'll see, it says, Mein L. Cook. It means my little chick. My grandmother was five foot ten and hardly a little chick. 
but he was also very tall. So anyway, I'm going to give you the background of this one soldier's story from birth until his end. He started up in Datisdorf on the North Sea. This is still there. The family was up there for quite a few years. That church, uh, 1600s, maybe post Martin Luther, but it was a pagan mound before that. And I got to go into it, big giant brass key, and they let you in. So the family starts up there. My great-grandfather is on the North Sea. He was a shipper going down the Weser River until, make sure I get the right one. That's the old churches. The gravestones are still, and I, you walk back in time and say, oh, really? Now, that's the church. Now, that's grand Grandpa, that's Karsten, and Juliana Haas and Ficky. We can't tell you what the last name means in English because it's a bad word. Uh, it's the F-bomb cognate. Really? Absolutely. That's where the F-bomb comes from, right. which means thicken is a verb to till the soil, to fertilize. Thicky here means son of Fred. But boy, I walked into a cemetery and I walked into it. We don't say that here. And in fact, when my uncle went into the army with the German soldiers, he said, my name is Charlie Fritz. Mm -hmm. This is the family house. Now here is Uncle Leopold, my um I guess it's my grand great grandmother's brother. He was the wine master for the Duke of Oldenburg. So he talks, and that house is still there, it's still in the family. So he talked, they took the grapes off the door on the far left, but he talks his brother in law to come to Oldenburg and be the fish handler for the Duke of Oldenburg. So they do. Well, interestingly enough, they end up on Gaststrasse. I took that picture in 2016. The White House with the blue um, shutters is that family, a fish store. It's now, it was kind of weird. It's like a hiking store, sports, but they still have the displays look like they got a fish in them. And it was a three-story building and they had chickens out back, or so I'm told. Oldenburg's a beautiful little town. You'll notice that there are no cars. The irony is I met my wife here. And you see where that uh, do not enter sign is? A little bit north of that was her great-grandmother. Oh, They're from the same town. Yeah, wow. like, yeah, it's kind of weird. And our great-grandparents are buried in the same cemetery, yet we met in Pauling, New York. Wow. This is just the man with the derby, his great-grandpa. And this guy here on the right in the fur coat is the Grand Duke of Oldenburg, known as the Gross Herzog. And I, he was a big guy in many ways. Anyway, here are my ancestors. My grandfather is on the far right. His brother, Willie, well, Wilhelm, look at the mustache on Wilhelm, mm -hmm. the Kaiser mustache, mm -hmm. and the, uh, the mustache on Julius, as he was known, and Hans. Now, how did they end up? The two outside brothers were killed. Hans and uh, Julius come to America. Julius dies hopelessly homeless in the gutter in Hoboken, and a drunk. Mm -hmm. And Hans ends up in Conway, Arkansas, and never spoke a word of German again, and he was known as Uncle John. Therefore, his wife was Daisy, so I have a cousin Daisy, cousin Betty Jo. Okay. Now, this is a reservist picture of my grandfather with my Tante Trudel. My Aunt Trudel is in front of the barracks. I met her. I knew her right up until she died. And this is the other grandmother. This is my mother's side of the family. You see the little red arrow? It's East Frisia. It's right on the Dutch border. Mm -hmm. And the joke was, when you, when a farmer needed a cow, he went to Holland, got a cow and a wife. At the same way, why waste a trip? I mean, really. And he, so my great grandfather here, Henrik Meyerhoff, was married to a woman named Talka Fucken. I didn't make that up. And they had one daughter, and then the second daughter, she dies in childbirth. Mm -hmm. So a year later, he marries my great-grandmother, Johanna Janssen. The infant mortality rate was so incredible. Mm -hmm. My great-grandmother had 10 births to have four children. Wow. Yeah. yeah, and there were no doctors up here, just veterinarians, which is kind of weird. And how they lived so long up there, I just had a cousin die. She was 98. Mm -hmm. This was the windmill. I found out recently that windmill was my great-grandfather's, as was the inn on the right. And he was a very rich, big, rough guy, but he fought in the War of 1870, which you see on the left, uh, not to be confused with other wars. He was in the Navy. 
They thought he was dead, wrapped him up in sailcloth, and he moved. So somebody said, Meyerhoff lebt noch, which means Meyerhoff is still alive. Wow. And the next thing you know, here I am. And if you look at the picture on the right, that's my great grandmother, and the little little child with the umbrella is my grandmother. And why are they holding hands? I have never figured that out. But my graduation picture with my grandmother, same thing. She always held my hand every picture. Now, my grandmother is on the right. She's about seventeen, and my grandfather is coming to hunt wild boar. And he goes into the inn, as the story goes sees her and says, I didn't know ro roses were still blooming at this time of year. <laughs> oh. Right. She fell for it. Uh, her brother Rudy made her wait on the table. Anyway, they got married. I think she had three children by the time she was 23 with four births. And he moves to Oldenburg as a peat salesman. Very successfully. Nice house. This is uh, with my Aunt Julie. That's her. She must have been about 18, 19 there. They move to this house in Oldenburg. My camera broke, 1959, so I did the best I could. The house on the right is where they lived, or the windows are, and on the left, you'll see paintings on the wall. That was Professor Winter, a very famous artist who would paint the children and so forth. That's Professor Winter in his house. He was 96, and I actually had tea with him and his wife in that house. The house is gone. And the furniture is in the museum in Oldenburg. Hmm. If you look at him here, the painting in the upper right, there's four, four little children dancing in the right hand bottom. Those, I think, are my mother, sister, and brother. And he, unfortunately, he got quieted and kind of put on a shelf because he was one of Hitler's favorite artists. Hmm. Nice. To, but if you look at this museum wall, uh, this is the museum in Oldenburg, the State Museum. That picture of my grandfather is up on the wall next to the fireplace. And uh, it's a beautiful old house. I actually sat at that table. So he would call the kids in and paint them. If you look on the left, the little the little girl there is my mother. And Aunt Julie is there. That picture is hanging on the wall in Maui. And an Uncle Carl down the bottom, Carl Heinz Wilhelm Leopold, known as the Little Prince. Um, more on him. He ends up as a World War II officer. America. This is Kegelabend, beer, beer night. That's a German tradition that um, if you really want to get involved with and get carried home, he's the far left. Yeah, he, he did that one time. My grandmother, no, he never did it again. Now, the Kaiser Wilhelm, what the public thinks of me is totally immaterial to me. I decide according to my conviction, although I do then expect my officials to do what they can to correct the false opinions of the public by whatever means seem appropriate. Look at the mustache. Look at every soldier had to have this. And it's more about that mustache that is interesting. He, he, his favorite thing was to go summers as a kid and play toy soldiers with his grandmother, Queen Victoria in England. So he was dead fluent in English and um, very odd. He was nicknamed Kaiser Bill. So all the soldiers are mounted up, heading off to war, as you can see here, towing the cannon. They put on their helmets. Now, these are leather. They're called pickle halba. And you unscrew the brass thing in the middle and put the cover on it until somebody realized that leather is not going to do it. So in the last year of the war, they have the Roman helmet, which is copied off the Roman helmet, if you're looking at movies. They all, this is in Oldenburg, actually, as all the soldiers from Oldenburg went off to war. Women were cheering, they were throwing flowers, and they were in the in the boxcars, very famous picture. Uh, we're going to be in Paris, and they will be home by Christmas. And my grandfather told my uh, older aunt, she was five, I'm going to bring you a new dress when I come home for Christmas. He never came home. Mm -hmm. Now, in November, they want to go through Brussels. Brussels doesn't want to let them through. And now it's a contention as to why Brussels resisted and, you know, the nasty Germans came through and they were shooting people, hanging priests and killing babies. That's what the Kitchener report said. Unfortunately, the only report coming from the front was through Britain. They cut all the others. So the German ones, the French ones were not just a Kitchener report. 
But it bothers me because my grandfather said, as he wrote, he felt so badly for these people. Uh, by the way, this is just the kind of book you got for Christmas when you didn't get home. It's called Fathers in the War. And um, there's a, a storming infantry, and that's what your father was, a hero, and all of the kind of rhetoric that you could possibly believe. This was a field, a field postcard, a field postcard given to you by the Kaiser. You can see the date on it. It's May. Is that No, it's August 5, 1914. And he wrote it to Dobbenstrasse, to my grandmother. Challenge. He also wrote from Osnabrück, where they started to train, and that's one of the other postcards. Then he gets to Namur, which was pretty well destroyed by the German army coming through there, but oh, under the command of von Bulau. Looks pretty fierce to me. This is a picture when his knapsack was sent home that he carried in an envelope. That's my grandmother, the little prince, my mother in the middle with no hair, and Aunt Julie, or Juliana. So on the back of it, it says, uh, my dears, we took this from Alvin. It was in an envelope. And one of the men who was, who was with him came home with a description of his death and, and this but look at this picture. This is the German soldiers feeding the Belgian children and women who were without food. And he said that seems to be the right thing to do. And then they, uh, he said they hung a priest. He said, but the priest was shooting at us from the second story window. So they moved on to Bremont. And you will see what happens to Bremont. The German army is storming through Belgium. And this is Bremont. And I thought it'd be interesting to see it from a German point of view. So this is the Westliche Kriegsauplatz. Now, the, the issue here is the French, even into the Second World War, are fond of putting cannons and artillery in the church. And when the church got blown up, all the nasty Germans blew up a church. That happened too. And this is uh, what the battlefield looked like at that point from the French point of view. This is the German soldiers being decorated. This is for Verdun. But my grandfather, right about this point, got the Iron Cross for bravery. He went out and rescued the captain of a, uh, a captain who had been killed. He also, knowing him in the letters, you have to read the book, he dives into a trench when he sees the French soldiers coming at him. And the man in the French looks up at him and says, hey, are you Ficky? And my, father, my grandfather says, yeah, I'll get you out of here. The man had two broken legs. He gets a stretcher. He's coming along with a stretcher bearers with the body of the dead captain first. And here comes the French marching at him. What he did, he put the, he put the um, stretcher down, had everybody take off the helmet and start to pray. The French went right by. Mm. So he got, a, he got an iron cross for that and um, for bravery. And he also got the gentleman out too. So they marched again through Belgium. They end up in Reims, or Reims, whatever you call it. And that cathedral got destroyed too. He said, when we got there, they had sandbags in the window with machine guns pointing at us. So this is now on the way to France. Interesting story. When you see the movies, you always see the dirty, muddy, filthy trenches, right? Mm -hmm. Well, this is a German bath train. And the Germans brought a train with hot water, every man two days on the front, and then back to bathe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as best they could. And it's called a Badezug. As you can see here, with all the hot water, the Badezug. We don't. Now, this is a mock up of the amount of food it took to feed the German army for one week. How much bread, meat, potatoes you can imagine was happening on the home front. You weren't getting much of this. Everything was rationed. Mm -hmm. This is what a German trench looked like down where he was in the Champagne Valley. Now, the issue is the Germans built great trenches. The French did not. So the French figure out the best thing we can do is bomb the German trenches and take them over. This battle line in the Champagne Valley moved 300 feet in three years with a lot of deaths on the way. This is the German trench diggers. You can see all the mustaches on them looking like the Kaiser. This is a haystack, which were all over down there. My grandfather, again, wrote about that. He saw the French army coming. They dove in the haystack and then fought them from, and they, you know, surprised them and all. That was fairly common. 
This is, again, the German trenches before they get up, up and over. And you can see it's farm country, which is important to remember. Uh, the, they had ledges to stand on, not what you see in the movies, and they were pretty well um, socked in. Now, the church is here because my grandfather was a bass soloist in all the churches, Catholic Church and um, the Protestant churches. But they held the church services for the French who were not in the war and for the soldiers. And because he could sing, we'll see in a minute, he got another assignment. But this is the picture that became the poster. He's in the middle. He is not carrying a, back, a knapsack. He also wrote about this because there's a dead body down there. And these paintings, uh, paintings, yeah, these faces come from a painting that um, Professor, a photograph, let me restate that. The faces came from a photograph. Uh, Professor Winter was an amateur photo photographer. So then he would translate them to paint. Now, that's the photograph. Here's Grandpa, here's Uncle Willie, and here is this face that you could see in the, in the poster. And this is in his study and studio and his where he took the pictures. This is what the Aim Canal looked like in 1914 even. It just got demolished. Well, Christmas comes along and mail Here's the mail delivery, which was very, very important to them. The problem they had, though, is when they got a package, it was usually plundered. Mm -hmm. So they did something. They put lead on the knot so you couldn't open that. You know, you knew it had been opened. And this is how they slept. He said, we slept inside. That's in a hole in the side of the trench with a blanket over them. He said, we're like rats in a cave. He said one of the occupations was to kill the rats. And um, it's a Schlafzimmer. Now, if you notice the word at the bottom, Schutzengraben, it means shooting graves. A grab, somebody tried to tell me it was a ditch, but maybe not. This is my grandfather's two sisters. I knew them both. Tante Trudel on the right, Tante Keda on the left. Now, Tante Keda had a husband who was exempt from military service and upset my grandfather. She was marching him all over town, showing off her fiance to women who had lost their husbands. Mm -hmm. A million men lost their lives, the German. Tante Trudel, oh, she was a piece of work. She spoke English. I had to stay with her. And boy, you talk about Victorian Germany. This is Christmas. By the way, you see the cigarettes? They thought that was a stress relief, both sides. And they hang their dog tags on the Christmas tree. This is a Christmas party. My grandfather's over here for the Iron Cross Awards in Christmas. Now, he got a very strange commission. You'll see him on the right here. He was told to round up the women and children widowed and do a Christmas nativity pageant for them, to direct it and bring music and, of course, to feed them. Which So he was exempted from the front for that short period of time. For Christmas, if you were a private, you got a cigar. If you were him, this is his cigar box from the Kaiser, which he covered with paper filled with chocolate and sent home to the good children from the Santa Claus in France. And you can see the distribution of cigars here on the Western Front. The odd thing that happened, and everybody thought was a scam, but it was not, is on Christmas Eve, you know the Christmas Eve story? Yeah, it's, it's true. Yeah. It's true. Mm -hmm. They just found letters from a British soldier in an attic, mm -hmm. and they were playing soccer yes. and singing. And, mm -hmm. you know, they turned their rifles upside down and held them up. Mm -hmm. And I don't know which one started. Next day, they were shooting at each other. Now, we skip to Belgium, to Ypres. You'll see my grandmother's brother, Uncle High, with his Iron Cross. But Uncle High, we think... When the Germans released gas, they sent the reservists behind us, behind it, and then the wind changed. So we think he was gassed. We do not know. But in 1930, he took his own life. He was married with five children. But they sent him first, if I can find it. Oh, this is my, it's hard to explain. It's my grandmother's sister's brother, brother-in-law, who later became brother-in-law again. 
She married his brother later on. Now, Uncle Hai was sent here to Tegel Mental Hospital in Berlin. And my grandfather's letters reveal that. You see he has no bandages? Oh. We think he lost it. Now, this was a mental hospital. Nobody talks about it. Because this is the mental hospital. I believe Adolf Hitler was there with him. Hitler was sent to the mental institution as well. And he, he was running through bullets. What had happened is Hitler had a little white dog. And, and that somebody either ate the dog or killed it. And he went off. He was running through bullets. But what, again, people are not aware of is Hitler was a terribly abused child. His uh, mother and father came from a town in Austria where there was so much intermarriage that Papa called his wife niece. And then every night would take Hitler up in the room and beat him. Mm. And then his mother died. He was just off the loop. Now we'll show you. Mm. I think this is Hitler right there. Where, we where can't am I see your mouse. Or you can't see my mouse. No. Well, it'll get better. We'll pick it up on the next slide. This is the charge that the infantry would make up the hill. You know, much chance there. That's what the battlefield looked like. Now, Grandpa was, and where it says Perth down the bottom, Perth, Erlu. And if you look to the left, Suane is where he's buried. But Perth, Le Herlu, you're not allowed to go into anymore. The French government closes it down, say, for one day a year for a memorial. They claim there's NATO drilling going on there and so forth. But it's not true. They don't want you to see this, the, the, what the town looks like. This is uh, the French side. Here's what was happening. The French were in that village, and they were not coming out. Soldiers were mutinying, and the French idea of a successful battle is to have a large number of dead. The more dead, the better the battle. So if you see the movie Paths of Glory, what he was doing was picking six men at random and executing them for cowardice and bombing their own soldiers to get them out of the trench and across the uh, across the valley. Now, that's the Germans had zigzag trenches in this very chalk-laden, muddy, cruddy ground in the Champagne Valley in the Argonne Forest. And that's what the war battlefield, probably as my grandfather saw it, that's only in 1914. Can you imagine by 1918, there's nothing left. But the French threw a bomb into a crater. Grandpa is sitting there ready to go home on leave. It was his problem. He was a sergeant. He was due for a promotion to lieutenant. He had a, a conflict with the commanding officer, and he traded off the promotion to get the leave to go home at Christmas. But he was an acting lieutenant. The acting lieutenant leads his troops with only a sword into battle. The sergeant is behind it. So he picks up his sword, runs into one of these craters, and catches a bullet right between the eyes. And that was, yeah, we found the death certificate. Yeah, it was horrible. And the men with him, and I'll show you the, the wounded list, I think 120 men killed and wounded in 20 minutes because the French were up at the top. Mm -hmm. Hanging out there. Yeah, yeah. So this is what the town where he was killed looks like, probably still today, oh and why they won't let you in. Uh, Can you No. Yeah. Well, a lot of these towns are just gone. And this is also another shot of the town. All those cannon and artillery and everything going back and forth is pretty horrible. This is um, the same. Uh, I love the Great War. Perth, Lair, Lou, another view. So there's not much left of it. I saw it from the top of the hill down, and it, they were still firing tanks and rolling back and forth. It's pretty awful. This is the residual. One of the men who reported my grandfather's death ran back over the bodies of his fallen comrades, and he was wounded by falling on a bayonet that was sticking up. Now, you can see the map down there, Suane, where Grandpa is now interred. This was a map that was sent home. If you see down there, it's a Stellung. That was the camp. And when they started to bomb the trenches, he runs up to, to G and F, and where the little cross is where he was killed. And um, then the bodies had to be collected and sent home. Unfortunately, a neighbor had seen it. My grandmother received the news at the funeral of her aunt in West Friesland. And the only thing she could do was hire a cart at four in the morning. My mother said she never cried when you could see her. But every once in a while, you would catch her 
sobbing on the floor. And uh, she was strong. She was the strongest woman I ever met, by the way. Uh, this is also Suwain, which is now a cemetery. And this is what's left of, was left of it. And there are the chalk trenches and the, the French up on the side there. Again, another view of the battlefield. Burying the dead. It would take them several days, and we'll talk about that. This is the dog tag that they carried. Just two holes had a leather strap around your neck. You had two of them. One was left on your body, and the other was nailed to a wooden cross to identify your remains. However, that's if you had any. This is a French grave and a funeral, and I was there in that cemetery. That grave in the front is holding body parts. And the one brave I saw had 4,000 remains with the names listed. I mean, they knew who they were. Whoopee. And right next to the Germans. This is the cemetery as it was after the war. And the Germans finally redid it in 1965. And that's where my grandfather is buried. Each one of those stone crosses has four men underneath it. And I have a directory at the door so you can find them. And uh, I will show you his in a minute. And what years of oh, this piece are all like throughout the whole oh, yeah. war? No, this is six, 1965. Thing. Mean, I'm sorry, what was your question? No, this, this cemetery, it's just, they're buried uh, from 1914 to 1918. Right, yeah. The and then and the French are right next to them. And the British outside the gate, they didn't like them. Yeah. So this is his grave. It says an unbecon unknown German soldier and Alvin Fickey. And then on the other side is another two men. And when you go there, there's like a mailbox. You take it out, gives you a directory, tells you where to go. It's beautifully organized and done. Now, this is the monument right there, which you saw in the beginning. This is the battlefield in 1980. It's no longer there. I went. I wanted to get down in the trench. I actually did. Found the barbed wire, which I misplaced. And what happened was, here's another view. The um, here's, this is more what those are all those plants are growing in crater shells, crater holes. But in about several years ago, maybe in 2005, French farmers were hitting live shells. And they were losing six of them a year. So this is all farmland now. We all got leveled. However, I understand that even at the Battle of Waterloo, they just hit another shell. Some poor guy. Yeah. The aftermath of the war is what, what really we're talking about here. Next month is World War II. I think that this is Uncle Willie's grave. They were buried where they fell. There's 16 men in a two-foot square grave in Langemark. Now, in Langemark, Belgium, they hated them so much, they're not allowed to put a cross. All the stones have to be flat. And this is Uncle Willie, if you see down mm -hmm. the bottom line. Wilhelm Ficke, Unter Offizier, was killed uh, May 8, 1915. My great-grandfather had two boys in America. These two killed, had a stroke. Just couldn't handle it. Mm -hmm. This is my grandmother's other buddy, Uncle Woody, but he suffered from arthritis and was way older, so he never, he just guarded POWs. This is Uncle Hans. He was in the hospital with some wound or other. But Uncle Hans was an armor launder. So I have these family pictures. Uncle Hans is on the left. My grandmother's sister, Tante Maria, president of Germany von Hindenburg, to the end of his life. He came back to the armor launder every year for the folk festival. And this is cousin Honey back there in the middle. And he visited the armor launder and died shortly thereafter. And the paper, newspaper, is a picture of him in the front. And you open it and it says, Hitler is now there charge so it, it this all affected so many people this is um, a sicilian shula in oldenburg my aunt is in the front row on the far right and she is um about 15 14 13 and that's what she when she came to america will show you what happened just keep this is a very exclusive girls school by the way which my grandfather's family was paying for a private school. It's still there. My grandmother is dating her sister's brother, a uh, brother-in-law named Uncle Fritz. This is not Uncle Fritz. This is Uncle um, Gus August. 
I didn't like him. He comes, he, he had China blue eyes, comes in, sweeps my grandmother off her feet, takes him away from his own brother, promises her everything, puts her furniture in storage, we'll be back. My mother met Uncle Fritz before he died, around 2000. He's never married. He said, my brother stole my bride. After all those years, he was 95. So Uncle A, he promises him everything. Well, it turns out the guy's a bit of a ne'er-do-well. Uh, he smoked excessively, and he died early with lung abscesses. But they did go back and visit. And but she never moved back to Germany because by the time they were ready to do it was 1939. Mm -hmm. So if you look at this casualty list, which by the way are all on ancestry, the top one, the officers go first. Uh, this is the 74th Reserve Regiment, and you'll see the second line down Alvin Ficke Gefallen. Mm -hmm. Gefallen means killed. Mm -hmm. Look at how many Gefallen's going down that list. Mm -hmm. Now, what, what do you get? I have a great uncle who died on the Mon in 1914, but like a few Look up the ancestry. And they have all these lists because my family, they don't even know where he's buried or anything. Wait, I got more. Oh. <laughs> okay. Um, do you have ancestry here? Yeah. Free? Yeah, it's Heritage Quest, but it's their ancestry. It's the same thing. This is on Ancestry. Just look up the World War One casualty lists. You need to know his unit. That's the only, but you can find that out not too difficult because this is Adolf Hitler's record from 1908. He was from the Austrian infantry and he told everybody he was severely wounded running through battle. He was a hero, right? Well, if you look up here, see Adolf Hitler. Yeah. Life wounded, which means slightly wounded. Yeah. And you can see all of these. This is reserve infantry. Yeah. Where they're from. Oh, yeah. He was from Brano in Osterreich. Yeah. And these other guys that's in Austrian. Anyway, this is Hitler. If you notice, and this is Adolf Hitler in World War One. You see the Schnurrbart or the mustache? Mm -hmm. He cut it off in protest. For war, for the armistice. So he always had that protest mustache. And that's what he looked like. And I wonder if this is Uncle High in the mental institution, is that really Hitler? Oh. I think it was. Oh, yeah, he looked on the right. Yeah, but here's what happened. This is the Bailitz Heilstetten Hospital in Potsdam. It's still there. It's a ruin. Post- war sigmund freud was studying post-trauma stress mm -hmm. syndrome had to leave because he was jewish and hitler's doctors all his records disappeared and both his doctors were found dead with a bullet in the head oh. hmm. so we're not too sure what went on there but if you really think he was nuts he was and this is this this picture is recent so i went to um berlin we took a walking tour and we asked them where is the famous hitler bunker mm -hmm. Right there, that parking lot. Yeah. Oh. You see the little bitty brass sign? Mm. That's all that's there because they don't want people, you know, the crazy people. So yeah. And why make them a hero? You know. So um, this is the address book in Oldenburg. You can find those on Ancestry too. Uh, Vicky Alwin, he's a Geschäftsführer, well, you know, mm -hmm. manager. And this, if you're looking again, you can find um, Grab. Grabstedt, and just look it up as Grabstedt, and it would, if you put the soldier's name in, that's all you need, it'll come back and tell you where he's buried, what town he's from. It, it looks like this. You see the Zucha, the German helps. You see Alvin Ficke, 2-18-1915. And then not only that, it will take you to the grave and the graveside, you know, which is pretty cool because you found I found other people that and uh, the Kriebsgerbstetter Suchen, that's what it's called. And Suwain is where that, I've driven there twice. It was not a pleasant drive. This, now, my reaction as a kid to World War I, knowing nothing except my grandfather was killed. This is the Kingsbridge Hospital in New York City. As kids, fifth, sixth grade, we wrote cards to the World War I veterans. 
That's how long ago. And we celebrated on Armistice Day. This is a great story, too. Armistice Day. This is my math teacher mm -hmm. from ninth grade, junior high school, 52 in Manhattan. Mm -hmm. My entire class, except for two or three of us, was Jewish. I didn't know until mm -hmm. this guy was a crazy teacher, but wonderful, right? He was my worst enemy when I took algebra and my best friend when I got through it. He was mm -hmm. so good that he told my dad, I have to make him hate me for him to learn. And 30 years later, I took an algebra exam and still remembered I have a bit of it. No. And I found out just about last week that he studied in the yeshiva in New York and was a teacher in the yeshiva. Mm -hmm. His teaching methods today would write him right out of town. <laughs> I mean, really. But he comes to me spring. He says, Lubrecht, you can read fairly well. We're doing the Armistice Day Assembly. I said, oh, okay, Mr. Boren. And you are going to recite in Flanders Field where poppies grow mm -hmm. from memory. Mm -hmm. So I did. And there, this poem, which became the most famous poem from World War I by Major John McRae, first field artillery in the Canadian Army. In Flanders Field, the poppies blow between the crosses, row on row, that mark our place and in the sky, the larks still bravely singing fly, scarce heard amid the guns below. We are the dead. Short days ago we lived, fell down, felt dawn, saw a sunset glow, loved and were loved, and now we lie in Flanders' fields. Take up our quarrel with the foe. To you, from falling hands, we throw the torch. Be yours to hold it high. If ye break faith with us who die, we shall not sleep, though poppies grow in Flanders' fields. He wrote that in the back of an artillery wagon with a pencil and gave it to a soldier. And that's how it became very well noted. There's a lot of music. And later, Nijinsky had a whole thing going on and uh, a lot of the other artists. Several poets, Owen Wister was killed. And a lot of the poets were part of World War I. Now, I took my grandfather's letters, here's the end of the story, mm -hmm. to that room and gave them to the archives in Oldenburg, his picture you can see up in the back of the wall. And uh, I felt, and that's the book, Leap and Cook, which I don't think is here. And there's my sainted grandmother on her 80th birthday. This woman, uh, she buried two husbands, raised three kids. And when I was in the second grade, I got a lead in a play. And she came. And she never missed a play between second grade until she was 90. I was doing a show and that. Mm -hmm. Turns out, I asked my aunt, why why did I get these letters? She said, don't you know? You look like him. He was a performer and a singer. And boy, she was something. And at the end of her life, she called us all in to her house. She knew she was dying. She's making plans, mind you. And she said, she and I always had a drink together. This is about 19. So we're going to have a drink. And my aunt says, you can't have a drink. And she said, where I'm going, I can have whatever I want. Mm -hmm. Took all of our heads in her hands, told us how much she loved us, said goodbye, and I never saw her again. So to do that kind of strength to me is just like amazing. Now, this was a letter from my grandfather to my grandfather's. Now, good night, my dear good wife. Don't make life too hard for yourself. You will get the children well again soon, and the dear Lord will surely grant that I come home safe and sound. Probably we will not engage with the enemy here until the end and go nowhere else. Now, a thousand greetings and kisses, your Alvin. He was killed in action shortly after that. And here's uh, his brother, too. So kind of you're trying to respect their memory as well, no matter which side they fought on. Mm -hmm. There has been, I went to Verdun, and there's two cemeteries next to each other. And they also have a cross section of a trench with the bodies and skeletons still in it behind glass. Mm -hmm. And you stand there at noon, and all of a sudden the bell's going. Mm. I'm going, uh-oh. I look down, and there's a plaque. It's where the French and German governments had shaken hands and said it'll never happen again. Mm. And this is after World War II, obviously, mm. because Hitler said he was so embarrassed because they lost, mm. which led to immigration, other things too, and starvation and all that. But that's for another time. So, and that's it. Thank you. I'm done. Mm. All right. We'll put the lights on over there. And uh, well, you know, that'd be a real good idea. <laughs> <laughs> if anybody has any questions, obviously. But I would.
I would uh, there anybody. There's only one person. Yes. And... Well, Evelyn has any question. <laughs> no. Oh, um, my, uh, <clears throat> my interest in your lecture tonight too was my great grandfather, uh, and sure. they were Germans, uh, Dona Schwaben, in yeah. Serbia. He went okay. to First World War with eight children left behind, and they never. He never came back. They don't know what happened to him. And I, it really, I appreciate your your admiration for your grandmother because that's how I feel about my great grandmother and my mother because they went through many similar things. And to hear it from the other side um, is very fascinating. And I love to talk about families and history and i re really appreciate you taking your time to put all this together and share your family history with us well it's interesting because once they find out you're doing it you get all the pictures and i was over in germany and i said well you want this picture well of course i do and um it, it's but with my last name uh if you have it you're related and i found i just met a cousin over the summer He's 81 years old, changed his last name. We met accidentally online, and I got to sit with him and catch up. And I also, another one in, near Stuttgart, I found in the phone book. And that's where I got all the pictures. She, My father didn't have any. And oh. uh, when I went, she gave me all the family pictures. But this, my grandmother, those that, that whole thing, I never knew till after she died what she had been through. All she would do is come to the event with a butter cake in the big shop right bag and um, very supportive, very supportive of me. My, when I was sixth grade, I had a lead in a play, final assembly. My mother couldn't come. My father was away on business. And I sat backstage weeping. And the next thing, and I would go out on stage and guess who? There she was standing up at the top of the little auditorium. And she was always incredibly supportive. Uh, and my high school was right near where she lived, so you could go over and get fed. You know, that was a very, <laughs> very important part of your I life. I noticed in the pictures you you take after your grandmother too. I could I could I see guess. around the mouth. I could see I could see well, your. Well, I know, your and she uh, well, she was ninety one or ninety two when she died, and she came to our house for Christmas the year before, and slipped on the stairs, and I caught her. And she looked up at me and said, I will not be back here for next Christmas. Mm. Oh. And, I said, and you know what? The, you'll get this, too. If you try. The doctor comes to see her. She had a tumor. She refused operation. And he, she said, he said, well, Mrs. Ellis, he, and she said, no, ich gehe heim. I'm going home. Mm. And she said, just give me some pills. I'll take them. And he said, no, we can't do that. She said, you do it for a dog. Yeah. Well, <laughs> no. Yeah. And she was... Um, she just stopped eating and drinking. And my wife said two weeks before they were close, she thought the sun rose and sat on my wife, by the way, mm -hmm. and they were close. And um, she said to my wife, uh, you know, my wife said she's preparing to leave. Mm -hmm. She put all her ducks in order, put everything, you need this, you need that. And then she lived to be 90, her sister was 97. My mother was 97 when she died. That's the end, you know, no doctors. How does that work? Yeah, right. But anyway, this story, part of this, Evelyn, is that I only hope that there's another side to the story. People suffer on both sides of the water. We're going to talk about that in December. Exactly. World War II and why the other family rest came. Um, the rest of the family came. My problem was uh, this all started because growing up German-American in an old Jewish neighborhood was interesting. However... Everybody in the neighborhood spoke German. You figure it. So thank you. Thank you, Evelyn. Thank you, ma'am. Oh, I just have one question. Where, sure. is, where is Oldenburg? What part of Germany? What state? Uh, uh, Oldenburg in Oldenburg. You know where, uh, if you go up towards East Frisia, Oldenburg is near, let me see, not about an hour from Bremen. Oh. West oh, of Bremen okay. and... Yeah. Yeah, it's up northwest and a little bit up above Osnabrück. And um, the thing that I always find fascinating, I asked German people on, on a bunch yesterday, have you ever been to Ostfriesland? No. They do Ostfriesian jokes, you know. Hmm. 
How many Austrasians does it take to milk a cow? 24, one to hold each other and the other 20 to move it up and down. That's the kind of jokes mm -hmm. they tell. So you can imagine. Yeah, it's, an, it's, a, it's a beautiful little city and totally untouched through two wars. Mm -hmm. Well, wow. so, yeah. I enjoyed yeah, stories well, yeah, about, about your cup. Oma. That's my Oma. And the other one, she's born in Edafain, you know, Ostraudafain. And um, my, my wife, oddly enough, her family's from up that way, too. If you ever get to Germany, there is an immigration museum there in Bremerhaven, and it's the most magnificent one I've ever been to. It's just incredible. Hmm. So, and that, too. And most of this stuff the Mormons have, too. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. My yeah. Sister mm, mm. I went back to 1550 in Morristown for my dad. Wow. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good evening. Gute Nacht. Gute Nacht. Vielen Dank. Yeah. Sei gesund. Sei gesund.